Welcome to the lecture on global value chains and policy issues. Global value chain or GVC is having direct and indirect connections with different policies as it is not only affecting the international trade but it is also having a significant impact on other policies such as uh, industrialization policy or transport policy or policy on trade facilitations and innovation policy. So in this slide, we briefly identified uh, some of the major uh, policies which are having direct and indirect connection with the global value chain. Global value chain is based on the ideas of possible gains from fragmentation of production. So if there is more ease to trade, then the benefit from fragmentations will be reaped easily. Generally, multiple border crossing uh, means more hassles. And at the same time, if there is a drive towards protectionism, then the cost of production goes up significantly. So more liberal environment uh, is necessary for a reduction of the cost because components and parts can cross the border several times. As we have noted that many of the subsidies and incentives which are being provided by different countries are uh, becoming ineffective because many of them are incompatible. So it's very important at this moment that what kind of policy incentive, incentives we can actually give it to promote global value change. So skill development, creation of knowledge, uh, investment on R&D, or even promoting service sectors which facilitate GVCs are extremely important. Uh, setting up of digital platforms because we are seeing the rise of business to business transactions internationally um, is also important. So in this context, promotion of foreign direct investment in sectors uh, or subsectors where global value chain is being spread is also important. So in summary, we can say that better trade facilitation and impo improved competitive environment is uh, are, are extremely important. Uh, and at the same time, the comprehensive trade and investment agreements with uh, the, the players with which the country is having global value chain or countries uh, developing global value chain is also very important. In this slide, uh, we'll make an attempt to expand the arguments. So uh, global value chain is uh, is developed due to the possibilities of fragmentations of production. So the benefit from the extent of fragmentation is possible uh, when the components and the parts can cross the border easily. So it's very important that there is a kind of an enabling trade and en trading environment uh, which can help companies to reap the benefit. As mentioned in the last slide, that uh, there could be policies which restrict trade, there could be tariffs and non-tariffs. And, uh, and when the global value chain is being developed, such kind of barriers actually increase the uh, cost of production significantly. Uh, hence, it's very important that how countries and the governments are actually coming together and negotiating these barriers uh, for the product or the sectors for which the GVCs are being developed. Several traditional policies, especially on taxes and subsidies, uh, which are not WTO compliant, are, uh, are difficult at this moment to continue with. So, uh, Maybe some sectors are being developed through such policies, 
but now government needs to get out of such policies and think of new policies uh, so that uh, GVCs are still getting support, uh, especially um, the way you are developing the SMEs. So many policies such as creation of special economic zones, uh, investment on trade facilitation, investment on R&D, product development, uh, or developing external economies of scales uh, are extremely important. So the government needs to think in a different way that how the new trade policies can actually help the GVC to grow. Surface sectors are extremely important to facilitate uh, the global value chain to grow. Uh, as components are crossing the border, so transport, logistics, communications are very important. At the same time, we have noted several business and professional services are also uh, uh, are also growing so professionals are moving from one country to the other country so uh, the competitiveness of the service sector are, are extremely important uh, to improve the quality of the value chain further uh, we have noted that increasingly the global value chain is becoming knowledge intensive uh, production process be are becoming more uh, like routine activities and around the production activities the other issues like design like product planning like uh, you know um, uh, like uh, conception uh, conceptualizing of the new product uh, when there are feedbacks from customers are, are making this entire uh, process become more knowledge intensive so it's very important that there are a set of policies by which actually the country can promote uh, the skill of firms uh, to adapt the new knowledge and also the firms in turn uh, can develop uh, the requisite skills among the employees. We have also uh, seen that because of the fragmentation and outsourcing, um, sometimes some of the critical and also non-critical activities are uh, being separated from the OEMs from their original factory and being outsourced. And sometimes it requires a foreign direct investment to move to those uh, countries uh, in that particular sector from where the goods are being outsourced. And these kind of investments should be promoted because these investments can generate uh, a lot of development benefits, such as uh, um, uh, employment generation, uh, technology transfer, uh, and also uh, help the SMEs to develop a new network. Comprehensive trade agreements can also help because uh, we have seen there is a rise of regional value chain. So the neighboring countries can easily come together, can develop a comprehensive trade agreements in which uh, the special focus may be given on those sectors in which uh, the global value chains are already established or the region are planning to develop it. Uh, there should be a clear cut policies for specific skill development and we have seen other uh, developments such as uh, the digital platform based trade so that you know uh, the countries can procure um, uh, procure goods and components from other countries through the digital platforms in this slide we can uh, you can see that uh, uh, that the trade in intermediate goods and intermediate service are significantly high. So uh, you can easily understand that not just the goods, but uh, the services, the intermediate services are also being, being traded. So almost 70% of the international trade consists of a range of transaction, uh, which uh, basically include uh, services, raw materials, parts and components, 
um, and that actually uh, has changed the character of international trade uh, throughout the world. So hence it's very important to support uh, this fragmented production process that more goods uh, and parts and components are traded. So trade policy needs to develop a complementary policy both for manufacturing and services. For example, the industrial policy can look into the transport policy and innovations policy and similarly trade policy can be linked to, uh, to, uh, to investment policies as well. So this kind of overlapping of the policies are essential uh, to support the fragmentation uh, process. As highlighted in the beginning, that more protectionism means more cost of crossing the border. So what uh, this particular uh, uh, figure is explaining that there are direct tariffs on inputs, there could be indirect tariffs on inputs, uh, and there would be tariffs on the final exports. So you can see that uh, uh, the direct and indirect tariffs on inputs are, uh, are basically a significant portion of the, of the tariff on the final goods. So uh, if the, the components is crossing the border and getting some value uh, added on these, and again it is moving to an another country, even if there are small tariffs at each level, uh, in an accumulated form, this total tariff um, is, it will be contributing a significant portion of the cost. Uh, and that's why it's very important that uh, there should be uh, a discussion among the countries who are developing the value chain among themselves must address uh, uh, the possible reductions of tariffs. And not only tariffs, even the non-tariff barriers can create a huge bottleneck for the easy development of the, um, of the, of the value chain. So even sometimes uh, countries are trying to depreciate or change the currency value, even the benefit of such values uh, will go down if there are uh, significant costs while crossing the border. In recent times, uh, we have seen there is a resurgence of, uh, of tariffs and other barriers, mostly fueled by the tension between United States and China. And, uh, and, and one study of UNDP has highlighted that US-China trade war might cost uh, global value chains of three to five years growth. So global value chain actually has slowed down because US and China are two major players uh, in trading of components. Further, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, the fear of, uh, of, of, of supply chain bottlenecks have increased and, and we have seen a lot of restrictive trade policies which further reduce the possible growth of the value chain. And in recent times, we have seen the cost of shipping goods across the globe is skyrocketing, threatening uh, to boost the consumer prices and, and compounding concerns. So GVC will remain in the core of the economic recovery as many studies have identified uh, because uh, now there are uh, hyper specialization and it's very difficult to go back uh, to a completely uh, kind of a uh, vertical structure within the country. So uh, it might be taking a different shape, but it is uh, very difficult to say that global value chain will cease to exist. So traditional incentives such as tax breaks, subsidies, etc. actually um, help uh, the countries to overcome uh, market failure 
even address uh, coordination failure. And uh, many countries are having policies to develop uh, the SME sectors as a supplying sectors connecting to uh, some global value chain through a different kinds of uh, subsidy structure. Many of these subsidies uh, are WTO incompatible and hence there is a need to understand that how actually we can allocate capital for developing this sector further. Uh, so one of the uh, areas where actually the investments are lacking is basically promoting R&D and promoting uh, you know, external of economies of scale uh, and also um, investing on skill development and trade facilitation. So, so rather than providing subsidies to farms, if governments actually uh, give their attentions to these areas, perhaps that might help uh, the countries and the sectors to move up the value chain and it might help improve the competitive positions of the firms. So in these slides actually you can see that uh, currently subsidies uh, uh, is contributing almost 29% of the distortionary policies and tariff measures 17%. Uh, Many countries are also having a local content policy. So because the country want to develop a backward linkage, but it should not be considered as a general policy for all sector. So uh, country needs to be very clear in which sector they can develop uh, the, the backward linkage and in which sector they can allow uh, the backward linkage to develop naturally. So. In some cases, local content policies may be required. In some cases, local content required, uh, uh, content uh, policies may not be required. So uh, apart from the backward linkage, the, the sector uh, must look for a possible forward linkage so that they can improve the, uh, the domestic value uh, content in the export. And uh, for that, uh, the cooperations between the government and the private sector are extremely important. So trade facilitation possibly one of the most important driver for global value chain to grow. So investment on trade facilitation is absolutely necessary uh, for for global value chain. As you have seen, uh, that countries who have performed, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, I mean, performed well in global value chain, um, they had a wonderful port infrastructure, uh, wonderful logistics infrastructure. And if you look at uh, the logistics performance uh, of these countries, ease of doing business in those countries, they are generally at, at a higher level. So uh, lean inventory, faster turnaround, um, good internal logistics, um, fast uh, border clearances, and less paperwork are etc. Uh, are etc. are essential for global value chain to flourish. So in this context, uh, paperless trade can also be promoted for faster clearances. So it is uh, very important here to note that uh, uh, the shipping delays are uh, more for the products which are having complex value chain. For example, if you look at uh, automobile, food products, chemicals, okay? Um, because, you know, there may be a lot of uh, uh, conditions, a lot of standards, licensing, and quality parameters, which are very important. So uh, streamlining those, uh, uh, those uh, policies can actually help, that, uh, help to improve the trade facilitation structure in general. Um, 
the countries can also think of uh, linking uh, other countries, especially poor, remote, and landlocked countries, because sometimes the cost of productions are very low uh, there. Um, uh, wage rates may be, uh, may be much lower. Uh, there may be uh, very easy uh, to get land, um, and, it, and, the, and, and it, it can be easily can be developed special economic zones and extended cargo terminals and all those things. So um, we must take the advantage uh, of uh, of that situation. But currently, it is not happening because uh, there's a chicken and egg problem, that there is a lack of international shipping and air cargo services to those places. And as those places are not developed, they are not getting um, you know, international ships uh, coming to those ports as well. So these uh, require uh, special attention because uh, in some cases, actually, we can expand the global value chain uh, to these countries. In this case, uh, we can mention uh, the food and nutrition value chain uh, in Pacific Islands, uh, which, are, which is helping them to grow um, uh, quite significantly because these uh, islands produce uh, fresh vegetables, fruits, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the horticulture sector can be developed very easily through a better technology, uh, through a better transportation and speedy transportation uh, to the bigger countries like Australia or Southeast Asia or China. Service-led development, uh, especially globalization, uh, post-globalization, the, the first development of the digital platform um, is extremely important uh, because the developing countries which are typically well endowed with uh, low cost labor are currently seeing uh, a major change because in many cases even the production process in those countries are gradually becoming capital intensive and as a result of that uh, this requires a lot of services around it for performance which includes transport, logistics, finance, um, and uh, professional service, uh, in, like engineering service, like design service, you know. So those uh, things are, are extremely important. So the diagram here actually uh, explains that product-wise, um, uh, you know, more than 30% um, is the uh, share of value addition by uh, some of the major services like distribution, transport, uh, communication and information, finance, business services. So these contribute a significant portion of it. And as you can see, the distribution um, uh, contributes among all the services significant in all the products. So uh, distribution service uh, include uh, warehousing, retail, connecting to retail, and large employment can be generated. And there could be technologies for uh, for uh, you know, quality controls and many other things are are uh, connected. So investment in those areas are necessary, which can improve uh, the performance in global value chain. So uh, some of the services. Uh, can be liberalized, for example, like transport services and uh, warehouse services, um, uh, managing the, the inventory, um, of which those services, if the domestic efficiency are absent and if the country wants to develop certain sectors and wants to push their companies certain sectors in global value chain. So uh, it's very important that uh, more private investments uh, are there in those services, including uh, including the foreign companies. So services also play a crucial role, not only in their own sector, but also um, it plays an important role uh, 
in the production process so around production there could be many services like you know uh, engineering services an important thing uh, development of the product uh, requires also a designing of the product so there is a basically a, a, a drive towards the certification of the industrial process so uh, the production per se has become a routine activity so around production there could be many other activities which which play an important role so two countries where uh, these strategies are working well uh, one of uh, example could be given like india and, and philippines uh, both are now among the leading countries for offshore business services worldwide because of their low cost human capital availability and attractive business environment and, and service sector india uh, which started its it journey through uh, a business process outsourcing and call centers has moved uh, uh, to a very high level of services like data analytics like analyzing consumer behavior providing uh, you know uh, analytical services in developing banking solutions uh, and uh, uh, and uh, mapping transport services globally so those are the sectors where actually country is specializing so that's basically helping uh, the global value chains to perform in in different countries with those softwares so uh, we have seen that service sector play a very very crucial role uh, in in uh, gbc performance so if the country service sector um, is not well developed so even when the smes are even when there are efficient smes there could be a case that uh, the performance is not up to the mark or not optimized because of the lack of uh, corresponding services in those countries So in the figure here, um, we can see that uh, the innovation plays a very important role in many of the sectors which are the champions in global value chain, like pharmaceuticals, machinery, and computers, electrical machinery, automobile. So uh, upstream activities like you know R&D design, as well as downstream, like you know in case of FMCG products like. Um, uh, distribution marketing and after sale service those actually are highly knowledge uh, intensive and data driven so uh, in many cases uh, especially in case of pharmaceuticals and consumer electronics um, uh, many companies outsource this entire production and they just manage the brand many pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, maybe having uh, a contract manufacturer, but uh, the company itself basically owns the product. Uh, in case of consumer electronics, in many uh, companies, actually manufacturing is done by small companies uh, under the guidance of the big companies. So as a result of this, what we can see, even, uh, even the SMEs, which may be located um, in other country, uh, requires to comply with the technological standards which is demanded by the OEMs. On the other hand, the big companies or the multinationals um, try to manage the brand, uh, develop new designs, um, codify the operational process and control the intellectual property. So what we require that we require an enabling policy, even in the developing countries, so that uh, the labor force can quickly adapt to the new technology, uh, because multinationals uh, keep on changing the new technologies um, to uh, to to support the demand uh, what is coming up globally. So to improve the efficiency, so they bring up new technology. So it's very important that if the developing country can adopt that technology, so uh, so that those countries also become part of the global innovation process. 
So what we require a significant investment on the skilled labor and also we require a robust intellectual property um, uh, laws in those countries. So what we can see that even a smaller country or a developing country, if they invest on, on knowledge, then they will become part of the innovation, So, which will not only help the global multinationals or global companies or multinational companies to improve their productivity, this can also improve the productivity of the SMEs and they will be able to diversify further. And uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, as a result of that, uh, even the smaller firms can think of developing new product, uh, which can um, even be uh, developed under the guidance of, of, the, of the multinational. So uh, the coordination between the big firm and the small firms um, are very important in this case. So the policy hurdles um, should not be there by which these coordinations are hampered. Uh, let's uh, let's focus on the investment aspect. So uh, everybody knows that you know FDI can help to get uh, new technology, can help productivity to move up, and also um, help uh, to do the innovations even in the smaller countries. But this is more uh, more uh, you know important especially if the firms are part of the GVC, right? So in that case, uh, what is very important to have a, an investor-friendly trade policy so that you know, investors' rights are protected and domestic companies' rights are also equally protected. Um, so in general, there should be a better regulatory environment and uh, and attractive FTI policies so that the GVC sectors also get uh, the FTI whenever it is, uh, is required. So um, strong intellectual property protections are necessary in this case and transparent policies on tax and uh, on royalties, uh, on dispute settlements are, are extremely important. So governments can play a role in providing information uh, needed to bring local SMEs together. Uh, there could be a lot of uh, 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 companies in the middle who can actually help the multinationals and SMEs to connect. Uh, so this kind of company uh, can actually identify the SMEs in, in the right way so that uh, GVCs can be spread in those countries easily. The figure here explains the challenges faced by lead firms and SMEs. Lack of financing is one of the main obstacles faced by small players because to be in GVC, uh, you require several investments in terms of uh, getting new technology, um, skilling the workers, as well as for networking. On the other hand, the lead firms highlighted the major problems in developing the global value chains are the customs procedures, high import duties, uh, licensing requirements, and related paperwork, and also in some cases, the domestic standards. Transport cost and uh, warehousing capacities, etc., are, are troublesome for both uh, small farms as well as the big farms. In this context, government can play a crucial role, bringing the two group of companies, small players and the lead players, in one place and can help in developing and handholding programs. Research shows that direct technical assistance from lead firms, either through the formal linkage programs or as part of the normal farm client relationship is one of the biggest source of spillovers to local suppliers. So it's very important in that context 
that government can also play an important role building the local absorptive capacity, bringing these two group of companies together. For local SMEs to absorb the spillover from GVC participation, ongoing investments are required in technology, process improvements, and skill development. As we have seen that, uh, interestingly, a uh, lot of uh, um, uh, global value chain literature actually uh, highlighting the phenomena that the rise of regional value chain, um, because in this case what is happening, um, uh, in, it, the, the, the lead firms uh, to reduce the, the risk, sometimes they are spreading their arms toward uh, the neighboring countries so that uh, you know a um, lot of cost especially the uh, distance and traveling uh, those costs can actually come down so in that case what is happening trade agreement with the neighboring countries becoming a driver uh, for for GVC so uh, One of the most important things uh, here is negotiation on customs barrier, uh, rules of origin uh, are, are playing an important role to promote GBC. So GBC literature uh, is also very clear about that, that easy crossing the barrier uh, and also an easy rules of uh, origin and a good trade uh, facilitation and uh, uh, people to people uh, contact easy mobility are, are playing an important role so those areas can be taken into consideration while negotiating trade agreement keeping in mind that those two countries are the set of countries are trying to develop our global value chain in some cases uh, the sectoral discussions are also very important so that the negotiator can identify the final goods, intermediate uh, goods, and the raw materials because these things may be uh, located or being produced like intermediate goods and parts and components may be produced in different countries. So all these countries can come together, can develop uh, a kind of a virtual map that in which way they want this global value chain to develop. So the sectoral discussions could be an important part of the trade agreement. So if you look at Asia, Europe, and, and uh, North uh, America, so uh, the diagram is, uh, is very clear in this case. If you look at uh, North America and Asia, the ratio of regional value chain to global value chain uh, is quite high, right? So almost uh, more than 70% is actually regional value chain. On the other hand, Europe um, regional value chain is coming down because European companies are now looking towards Asian companies or maybe Latin American company, countries for uh, sourcing the uh, components. So regionalization is most uh, apparent uh, in global innovation value chain, given their need to closely integrate many suppliers and uh, basically uh, promoting the idea of just in time. So this trend could accelerate in other value chain also. When there is a success of one value chain, so it can have a positive influence on other value chain. And sometimes, uh, you know, skills can be easily transferred from one sector to the other sector. So uh, when few countries are part of one value chain, then they can actually think of other value chain uh, for other products as well. Some of the, uh, the complementary policies, um, here let us discuss those policies, uh, which are essential uh, for GBC to develop, 
So one of the most important thing is the employment and the skill. So uh, if there is a focus on a specific kind of skill development, uh, keeping in mind that, uh, that the GBC is uh, of a particular sector's GBC, uh, either it is a growing GBC or there is a plan that uh, the GBC might come up uh, because of a common interest in different countries. So a large investment in those sectors actually help uh, specialized suppliers to grow. So this is basically a kind of an economies of scale. And there could be a labor market pooling because large number of, uh, of skilled people available. And there's a possibility of knowledge spillover. And because of those, um, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, help the countries to overcome uh, some of the challenges coming out from GVC, the literature is very, very, I mean, we have a vibrant literature on this, especially the possibilities of rising unemployment due to GVC, because in that case, the SMEs are not able to participate and uh, some of the, some of the subsectors in which the country could easily develop its uh, competency are not able to develop and hence losing the employment. So uh, to address that particular possibility, an investment on employment and skill, um, especially the skill development, are essential. So we just talked about the employment. Let us now talk about the capability of the firm. Uh, the developing country firms also need to improve their skill in managing uh, a new kind of business environment when they are part of global value chain. So uh, a new kind of uh, things, for example, IT-driven accounting systems or inventory management, developing network, and also effectively matching the need of the foreign buyers, uh, how to respond to a particular um, uh, demand, uh, and how to report the entire quality uh, segments of all the products they are developing. So these requires a kind of a, a new kind of a capability. So that's very important. Uh, uh, for for uh, for the sector to develop, and you can think of some policy towards this direction. So, um, a modern business education um, is very necessary in this case. So, university and business schools can actually work towards that to create the modern managers. That's essential. At the same time, uh, because the the GBC is very dynamic, the technology is changing very fast. So, we also require efficient engineers and also requires um, a local R&D and innovation culture to develop. So what we can think of universities, governments, and farms, uh, along with the university, we can think of a specific research institution must be brought together so that there is a, uh, a, there is a synergy among all these stakeholders which can drive the global value chain uh, to further that. So this is, these are the complementary policy which are very important for GBC to uh, move. Last, uh, the digital platform. So, uh, so what we see that some farms uh, have become a born global farms because um, these farms actually have not gone through the turmoil of structural changes in the business environment. So they can take the advantage of uh, high, fast internet and the growth of digital platform. As a result, uh, these firms can connect to the world very easily. So uh, it's not the case that firms need to sell fast domestic and then gain experience and then go international. Uh, no, that's, that's gone. So now because of uh, of uh, internet, um, many countries have developed platforms for SMEs 
to showcase their products and internationally the buyers can actually um, go to those sites and identify the suppliers because the platforms can sometimes provide a guarantee and assurance about the quality of the goods produced by the suppliers. There could be also network effects that more and more firms joining the platform, um, the cost of uh, doing business may go down because the firms are exposed to more customers and customers are exposed to more firms, so there is a possible competition-related benefits. So these can actually help a new value chain to develop because, uh, because of digital platform, there's rise of e-commerce and e-commerce, as I just mentioned, uh, is not just business to co consumer, but it is now business to business also. Uh, at the same time, the huge amount of data being collected through the transaction, um, through uh, the website search, and these uh, data can actually generate a new value and that new information can help the firms to uh, to design new product, to design new strategy even to enter into new product. So uh, being in the GVC helps the smaller firms to know all such facets and they can uh, they can develop their own strategy easily. So that is another uh, benefit. So uh, promoting SMEs through the digital platform can also be a good strategy. Let us now concentrate on uh, resilience and, uh, and rebalancing of global value chain, especially uh, keeping in mind the pandemic uh, related issues and post COVID new normal situation. So all of we know that uh, uh, global value chain is having a hidden vulnerabilities, but that is exposed uh, because first, uh, the political issues uh, due to US-China trade war, but later on, uh, uh, it is because of, of COVID-19. So value chains are exposed to different kinds of shocks, which could be a, a geographical, it could be a political, uh, also it could be natural shocks. Uh, hence, uh, what is important is uh, basically to rethink about uh, uh, in which directions actually uh, the GBC can move. So, uh, so let us first try to understand. In some sectors, um, it's more resilient because there is a sustainability of the demand, uh, especially during the pandemic, like IT products, like pharmaceuticals. Okay, but some sectors are um, are having a huge demand shock. For example, it could be uh, apparel. Um, even uh, tourism is having having a huge uh, value chain. Uh, which is a service-oriented value chain. So uh, that sector is our transport sector is significantly affected. So uh, so when we think of rebalancing, some sectors are having a natural advantage and some sectors are not having. Okay, so these particular aspects, first we need to keep it in mind. So in short, uh, what we can say that uh, due to COVID-19 and even before the COVID-19, that what was the trend we have observed since 2010, uh, now the value chains are less fragmented because a lot of um, midline companies have come up who have taken into account many activities. So, uh, so earlier first it was fragmented and then there is an agglomeration because these mid-sized companies have taken into account some activities under their uh, control. Uh, we have just discussed there is a shift from the global to a regional to sub-regional value chains. Uh, we have also noted the slowdown of FDI, especially in uh, promoting fragmented productions. 
and also there is a decline in the global trade. Building supply chain resilience can take many forms beyond relocating production. This includes uh, strengthening the risk management capabilities because in coming days the risk may come uh, from different dimensions and from different directions. So building redundancy in supplier and transportation network, holding more inventory, reducing product complexity, creating the capacity to flex production across sites, and improving the financial and operational capacity to respond to shocks and recover quickly from them are, uh, are very important uh, to strengthen the risk. We can give an example like how China, through its neighborhood strategy, is able to uh, manage the risk because uh, distance, cultural uh, similarities, uh, and also understanding the risk uh, or predicting the risk become very easy uh, when the companies are very close to each other and discuss and uh, travel and face-to-face, -face, through face-to-face -face meetings, they can actually uh, discuss and unearth a lot of possible uh, uh, risk and can take actions accordingly. Secondly, uh, there should be more investment now towards infrastructure, including uh, the in inf investment in trace facilitation process and also developing the surface infrastructure. Uh, focusing on uh, on skill development uh, uh, and the investment focusing on skill development is also an important thing. In this case, uh, both the government as well as uh, the industry associations and farms can join hands that in which direction the skill should be developed so that farms are not uh, not out of the the new dynamics of the global value chain. Internet-driven GVCs are uh, diminishing the importance of the physical stores and retailers, a new trend which is going to stay and going to influence the future development of global value chain. Actually, there are two sides of, uh, of the market. On one side, there are customers, and other side, there are manufacturers. Now, because of internet-driven value chains, now the customer's feedbacks are easily available and which can influence the manufacturers um, in, in developing the new product as well as the distribution uh, uh, of the products uh, and developing a future business strategy. Uh, this is going to have a significant impact on the labor market because uh, internet-based uh, virtual intermediaries will replace the physical intermediaries such as brick and mortar stores and, and it will displace uh, the physical presence of, of many people like clerks as well as uh, store managers because those will be done through, um, through uh, uh, sophisticated models to manage uh, uh, the stores through internet and it is going to have a significant impact on the on the new kind of uh, of jobs so some of the old kind of jobs will uh, will vanish and new kind of jobs will come up internet based virtual intermediaries have also developed a new kind of value chain uh, which is basically data driven value chain because there so much of data is being generated being processed so selling of this this data uh, could be a new business so uh, the companies do not need to do their own market research so they can get any information from uh, those data analysis which will be driving the business in coming days uh, what we have noted during the covid 19 pandemic that it has a huge impact on e-commerce and as a result of that, uh, this has revealed the need for diversity uh, to accelerate the resilience, especially, um, especially a, a basically an attempt towards 
uh, reconfigurations of the GVC landscapes what we are observing, which include uh, near shoring, reorganization of the entire business structure, and even also uh, reshoring. Uh, there's a strong focus on regionalism in this particular aspect. And finally, the role of digital platforms due to the internet um, has a huge impact on sourcing, production, marketing, distribution, and, and service network. And this is going to be the new future, a new dimension of GVCs, uh, which is going to shape the dynamics of GVCs in the coming days. That's all for the timing. Thank you very much.